Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to Mom's Corner. I'm, I hope everyone's doing well today. My name is Zainab, uh, your host, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. I want to thank everyone for joining us. We are so honored that I'm blessed to have you to share this space and time with you. And for those who are regulars on Mom's Corner, thank you for being here. For those who are joining us for the first time, welcome, and I hope you'll come back after this session. Um, and a big thank you to our amazing uh, group of doctors for being here today as well. Uh, Mom's Corner is one of the many programs under the umbrella of Global Perinatal Services, or GPS. Uh, GPS is a nonprofit doing some amazing work in changing lives every day. Our mission is to provide community-based doula services that will educate, respect, and empower low-income, Black, refugee, and immigrant women and their families during pregnancy, birth, and into early parenting. Mom's Corner is a space not just for moms, but for all women folk. Uh, at GPS, we believe that motherhood is an extension of a woman's identity and not the definition. Mom's Corner, since the pandemic, has become not just a space where we come together to find empathy, support, and camaraderie, but a safe haven and access to so many critical resources in our communities. Um, today's topic is uh, uh, drugs during pregnancy. And um, if you have uh, any questions during any time of the session, you can drop it in the chat box or send it to me privately. Um, and so without further ado, I will hand it over to our doctors. And thank you guys for being here again. Thank you. Um, feel free to call me Freshta. You don't have to call me Dr. Engel. And um, this is my colleague, Zoe. Um, we are here to talk about substance use. I'm just going to go ahead and share the PowerPoint. Um, so what we're, we're talking here today um, specifically about um, opioid use, tobacco use, and cannabis use. Um, and so there are a lot of different uh, substances that are around, but we'll focus on those three since they're typically the most common. Um, I'll start with opioid use in pregnancy. Um, opioid use in pregnancy, unfortunately, has been on the rise, um, kind of paralleled alongside the opioid use um, pandemic that's going on in the general population. Um, certain medications that are in the opioid class um, include oxycodone, hydrocodone, um, heroin, fentanyl, and morphine. Um, and the reason we're so concerned about it is because the rates of death associated with opioid use have also increased over the last five years. Um, and the reason it's so dangerous is because it can decrease your respiratory drive or the brain center uh, telling you to actually breathe, which can lead to decreased oxygen and um, eventually death in some people. Um, and so that's why we worry about it so much. And as you can imagine, it can also be dangerous in pregnancy. There are a lot of studies going on right now um, with opioids specifically. There are some studies that have showed an association with um, first trimester opioid use and some congenital malformations. Um, and those malformations are typically seen in people that have use disorders, meaning people that use um, opioids longer and um, more aggressively than the general population. Um, and so Sorry, those. Dr. those to, yeah, to interrupt, I think Dr. Zoe is saying she can't see the slides and I can't see them either. Oh. It looks like it's like stuck on a kind of loading, like a Providence SharePoint loading screen. So maybe just like close it and reshare it. Okay. Are you able to see it now? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Zoe, for finding that out. I thought it was on my end. <laughs> yep. Let's see. Is it a big screen the way you're seeing it? Like, is it the it full looks screen? perfect? Yeah. Great. Um, so here, here is a slide about the background that I was talking about and um, the statistic about the increased um, rate in death and that kind of stuff in opioid use. And that's why we're so concerned about it. Um, and this was a slide I was on about pregnancy specifically, since that's what we're here to talk about. Um, the What I was saying about the um, use disorder, here are the malformations that are typically associated with use disorders. So fetal growth restriction, fetal demise, um, and also preterm labor um, and placental abruption, which is an emergency. 
There are some medications that we have um, done studies on that uh, we use for use disorders, so opioid use disorders, including these two medications that I've listed here, the methadone and buprenorphine. And luckily, we've done a lot of studies on them, and luckily none of the studies show any sorts of congenital malformation risks, which is great news for us because it works really well in helping treat opioid use disorder. Um, and the reason we really worry about opioid use disorder in pregnancy is um, because of this neonatal abstinence syndrome or basically infant withdrawal. Um, and this happens in people that are pregnant that have used chronic opioids during their pregnancy. The things we see in um, babies in the neonatal period um, that we watch out for are um, irritability, high-pitched cry, poor sleep, and difficult feeding. And as you can imagine, those are really important for the um, first few weeks of life, especially the difficult feeding, because it can lead to um, weight loss in baby and that kind of stuff that we really worry about. Um, luckily, um, if we have parents that are pretty stable on methadone or buprenorphine, those two medications that I talked about that can help with opioid use disorder, they um, typically have decreased risk for withdrawal and also shorter hospital stays. We um, have done a lot of studies in this research and we are um, typically doing a pretty good job at catching these symptoms and have um, a lot of protocols that we follow in the hospital to help um, these babies uh, with these symptoms. Um, and also, yeah, and, and helping with the withdrawal overall. The other thing that's really important to know is that opioids do go into the breast milk. So um, if, you, if the parent is planning on breastfeeding, these opioid medications should be avoided. So this can be medications that we use for treating chronic pain and that kind of stuff as well. Um, and the reason is, is because there's a risk for, for infant overdose, because as you can imagine, babies don't metabolize opioids as well as um, adults do. Um, and so these are really important risks to go over with your doctor um, and should be discussed in detail before starting that sort of medication. So the next drug that we wanted to talk about is cannabis in pregnancy. So cannabis, also marijuana, pot. Um, I, can't, I can't think of the other things that people may call it, but hopefully that rings some bells. Um, it has two active ingredients that we think about most. So we think about THC and CBD. And THC is the component of marijuana that is psychoactive, which means that's the component that makes people feel kind of high, um, makes your brain feel differently. And we know that it crosses the placenta from a pregnant person to the fetus. Um, and we know that the ways that you use it can cause kind of different effects during pregnancy. And so um, if you are smoking pot, then that more of the drug is going into your bloodstream than if you were eating it, for example. Um, and if it goes into the bloodstream, then more is getting to the fetus as well. Um, and then the other component is CBD, um, which is not psychoactive and it's in a lot of lotions like hemp lotions um, and some people feel like it's helpful for pain control and that um, doesn't have any impact that we know of on a fetus and then something that I thought was interesting because people ask about this all the time for drug testing is that you can have a positive test for THC even if you were just in a room with somebody who is smoking um, you can get enough THC into your system that you can have a positive test for it and it could go into your bloodstream and thus to the fetus too. Um, a lot of folks smoke pot because they feel like it makes them less anxious um, and more able to deal with stress. And that can be certainly true for some people in the short term, but in the long term, we know that it has impacts on your brain and on brain development in general. And so over time, it can actually cause increased anxiety, increased depression, and sometimes lead to psychosis in folks that are predisposed to that. Um, and then also, even smoking a little bit, some people end up with something called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which means that they start vomiting and can't stop and it's really uncomfortable. Um, and one of the ways that we diagnose this is by having somebody take a hot shower. So if you are throwing up a ton and you can't stop and you maybe smoked a little bit of pot, then trying a hot shower is a good thing to try to help relieve some of that nausea. We don't know if smoking pot 
um, or ingesting marijuana in any way can make it more or less difficult to get pregnant. Um, but we do have some data about what happens during the pregnancy. So once you're pregnant, um, if you are using THC, we know that about 10% of the dose that the person is ingesting goes to the fetus across the placenta, um, and that that can impact the fetal brain development because the fetuses have THC receptors in their brain after 14 weeks. Um, and we have some data that for folks who are exposed to THC while um, their parent was pregnant, they sometimes have a shorter attention span, do less well on some testing um, areas, and sometimes have behavioral issues and spatial problem solving um, issues, as well as different motor skills. And then um, I didn't know this before this talk, but I think this is really interesting. So Freshta was talking about opioids and how they can go into the breast milk, um, but I think they go into the breast milk at a lower rate um, than THC does. So THC is more concentrated in the breast milk than it is in the parental serum. And so um, the baby is getting a much higher concentration of THC than the person who is ingesting it. Sorry, I forgot how to unmute. Okay, next I'll talk about um, tobacco use in pregnancy. This is an area that's been studied a lot, um, mostly because before we thought it wasn't really affecting um, people that can get pregnant, um, but now we've learned that it actually can. Um, and so the active ingredient in tobacco is actually nicotine. There are a lot of different forms of nicotine, like cigarettes, hookahs, vape products, um, lozenges, gum, patches, and all of these different products have similar outcomes on birthing parents. Um, and so usually a lot of people that are trying to um, abstain from smoking cigarettes turn to patches and gum. And actually a lot of the studies show that they have similar effects on um, a person that is pregnant. Um, and so in people that are trying to get pregnant, it can, uh, cigarettes have been shown, um, or tobacco in general has been shown to decrease fertility. Um, it is the leading cause of low birth weight and preterm delivery in the U.S. Um, and the most benefit to a pregnant person um, and fetus are observed when stopping smoking in the early phases of pregnancy, so less than 15 weeks. And some people at that point don't even know that they're pregnant. So it's really important to counsel anybody that can get pregnant that um, smoking is, is not great for them overall, but it's definitely not great for um, a fetus when a person does get pregnant. Um, some outcomes include, besides the low birth weight, are um, higher rates of miscarriage, stillbirth, congenital abnormalities, um, growth restriction, and um, some other things that are definitely emergencies that um, would result in like hospitalization for their need for emergency department uh, use like preeclampsia and placental previa and placental abruption as well. Um, in the postpartum phase, um, smoking cigarettes um, or any sort of tobacco products can decrease milk production and duration of breastfeeding. So if you have a parent that really wants to chest or breastfeed, it's really important to talk to them about this. Um, and nicotine does pass into the breast milk as well. Um, in the postpartum phase for babies, um, tobacco um, or any sort of nicotine smoking specifically can increase um, infant death syndrome um, or SIDS, which it's most commonly known as, uh, as well as childhood lung diseases, specifically asthma, but also can increase your risk for pneumonia um, and also other infections in general, but mostly um, ear infections and can increase um, the risk of obesity in um, children that have parents that smoke. Um, and that's kind of it. I mean, this was kind of a whirlwind. And I know that before um, you had talked with um, Dr. Greenman um, and uh, Dr. Schmidt about kind of alcohol use in pregnancy. So we didn't go over that here again, but we are happy to leave it open to anyone that has other questions about the substances we talked about or any other substances. Yes, there is a question in the chat box Yeah, from, from Danielle. She says, what yeah. about... Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So Danielle's question was, um, what about the cannabinoid receptors that are in other parts of the body outside of the brain? So there are two different types of cannabinoid receptors. Um, one set that lives in the nervous system, which you're totally right, Danielle, that is not only in your brain, that's also in your spinal cord and in some of your peripheral nerves. So your whole nervous system is your brain, your spinal cord, and then all the nerves that go out from that, that go to the rest of your body. And then there are also thought to be some cannabinoid receptors in some of your other like gonadal tissues and organs and also um, in some immune system parts of your body like lymph nodes. Um, and we don't know a lot about those. There's not a, re a lot of research about what those do or how THC impacts those. Thank you. Doctor, I was wondering about um, for like, is there a specific stage where women should avoid certain medications during pregnancy where it's much more risky than um, other stages, if you could speak to that? I can speak on that. Typically in the first trimester is when we want to avoid a lot of medications. And um, I know that we talked about like opioids specifically here, but in the first trimester, any medication can be like uh, any medications that is on the list of medications that could be harmful for, for pregnancy. The first trimester is where we worry about it the most, because as you can imagine, that's when um, the fetus is growing and forming the most. Um, and that can be like scary to some people because that's some people don't even know that they're pregnant in those um, in those times. And so um, that's where that conversation uh, with your doctor about any sort of medication that you're starting is really important um, to discuss, like if, if there is a chance to get pregnant, what are the risks and what are the outcomes that can happen? And just to acknowledge, it can be really hard to talk to your doctor or like some kind of healthcare professional about anything um, that you're taking, whether that's a prescribed thing or something that is not prescribed, especially something that's illicit, um, and even some kind, sometimes vitamins and supplements, but hopefully you have a doctor that you feel like you can really trust and be open with because um, just like Fresh is saying, it's really important to be able to have those discussions with them. So I would super encourage you if you don't feel like you're able to bring up things with your doctor like that, or you don't feel comfortable with them, um, I would definitely encourage you to find a primary care provider that you do feel like you can talk to about anything, even if it feels hard or embarrassing. Absolutely. And I, uh, just in preparation for this session today, I was uh, reading a study and it kind of made me wonder about a question. Um, it said that medication safety um, information in pregnancy is actually obtained through case reports um, and epidemi ep ew, epidemiological studies and animal studies, all of which have limited drugs during pregnancy are difficult. So when like when the doctors are determining what um, drugs to prescribe a pregnant person, are they kind of just being cautious because there, since there are no case studies in pregnant people or did just kind of like how what did they base their judgment on or their recommendations so you want to take that you want me to um sure so i think that that's i i would start off by saying that's definitely true there are some there are some larger studies that have included pregnant people in them, but a lot of times when we design studies, we don't include pregnant populations because it's thought of as a high risk population and people are worried about testing something that might negatively impact a fetus, which makes sense. Um, and so a lot of the data we have is retrospective data from when we learned that somebody was pregnant um, and they were taking a medication, then we see the safety data from that, but there's a lot that we don't know. Thank you for answering that. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for our doctors? What about for like um, people who are um, come in when they're like about six weeks but didn't know that they were kind of pregnant? So had been used in things like marijuana or, or such um, the first, let's say two weeks of their pregnancy. Um, is there great effects on those or is that? 
It's really hard to say. Um, I mean, at that point, I think that the it's the best time to have a discussion with your doctor about the medications that you're on and th those sorts of substances. And it's it's really hard not to know that like early on when you um, you are pregnant about those things. And so the best we can do is just talk to um, somebody that knows about the medications um, and stop at that point. I also think that like. So some of the work that we do in the hospital is with folks who are using um, a whole bunch of different drugs during their pregnancy and people have a lot of stress and anxiety and guilt around that. Um, and the vast majority of those babies turn out totally fine. Um, and so often the fetuses and the babies are super resilient. And even if like bad things happen during pregnancy or things that you wish didn't happen during pregnancy happen during pregnancy, mostly um, the kids are okay. And then also to Freshda's point, um, the like any change that you can make to decrease your use. So if you were smoking like a pack of day through the first six weeks of your pregnancy and then you found out that you're pregnant and you go down to smoking like two cigarettes a day, not like best case scenario, but still way better than smoking a pack a day. So anything that anybody can do to decrease their use over time and over the course of their pregnancy is helpful, even if they don't stop all the way. And the great news is that we live in an era where we have a lot of um, access to um, like ultrasound and other sort of screening that we can do. And so nowadays when there is some sort of congenital abnormality, a lot of the times you know ahead of time. And so you can you can help work with the doctors. Like for example, if there's a kidney abnormality, you can work with a nephrologist while you're still pregnant, a pediatric nephrologist, and they can they def definitely will have options for you and kind of outline how this will look in the future. Um, and so and so you'll you'll definitely be able to make an informed like plan for when when you do have um, the baby. I see a, a question in the chat box, Dr. Sakuma. Right here. Um, it says any common withdrawal symptoms in newborns whose mom used marijuana during pregnancy? <clears throat> I don't know. Um, mm. Freshta, have you seen that happen at all? I don't know the answer to that either. Um, that's a great question that we can definitely look mm -hmm. into and send you more information on if we find it. Mm -hmm. And can we have these slides, please? So someone's Absolutely. asking for the slides. Okay, sure. I, I will um, share it with you, Taylor. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure which medication or um, drug uh, street drug it is but is it cocaine where kids are born like shaking and they need to be like they just shake for for some some time do you know is that cocaine or that's and how do opioids kids, you know, and and opioids. sometimes coke sometimes cocaine too maybe but mm -hmm. um uh typically opioids is what we usually see um like newborn yeah. babies withdraw from the most because it's really yeah. long acting wow and uh, do those babies turn out okay like uh, neurologically um yeah. like later in life and how long does it take the effect to wear off yeah so a lot of these babies do for the most part okay we have a lot of protocols in the hospital one of them that um has been greatly studied is called the eat sleep console protocol um mm -hmm. and so um babies once they're born to um a parent that has used opioids during pregnancy they mm -hmm. um are started on this protocol which is mm -hmm. basically like every time a baby is shaking and every time a baby has some trouble feeding we just like hold the baby and make sure that they're comfortable and try to feed them a little bit longer and pay just a little bit more attention to those outcomes. And this this study, this Eat Sleep Console protocol has decreased the rate of, um, and so another way to combat this withdrawal is give um, babies some amount of an opioid medication, typically morphine to help with the withdrawal symptoms. But with this new protocol, we haven't even gotten to the point where we need to, for the most part, give these babies mm -hmm. morphine to help supplement and then withdraw them off and slowly wean them off. And so mm -hmm. for the most part, these babies do okay. And they like um, we have like plenty of studies that show that the sleep, eat, sleep, console protocol is safe and can help babies like for the most part recover. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And any idea of when like the, the shaking effect wears off or is it different with each baby? It's, it's most, for the most part, different with each baby. Um, we, 
in the hospital usually watch babies really closely for at least a couple of days um, but definitely keep them in the hospital for longer like at least five-ish days um, and mm -hmm. and sometimes um, if they are do require the morphine which like very few babies do with the sleep sleep eat sleep console protocol they mm -hmm. do require a longer hospital stay um, but for the most part it's we just closely monitor for the first couple of days mm -hmm. okay thank you yeah, um, someone says, I know one of the risk factors of marijuana is preterm. Wondering if all you, if you've seen increase um, trend, increasing trend of uh, preterm due to marijuana use. I think that there are a lot of reasons that um, mm -hmm. babies can arrive before we expect them to. So I don't think that necessarily we see an increased overall rate of preterm delivery that we can say is definitely due to marijuana use. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any comments, questions for our doctors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one more doctors, just for people who um, obviously have to be on, on medication, uh, you know, for uh, health reasons during pregnancy, do they kind of, are their medications adjusted once they get pregnant? Um, how do their doctors kind of make that decision? Like if you're, if you have asthma or like migraines and, and how do the, they impact the pregnancy as well? It definitely depends on the medication. And so each, some, for the most part, most of the medications that I can think of off the top of my head don't really change with pregnancy, um, but there are definitely some that we worry about and that we want to change. Um, and so specifically, if you have thyroid abnormalities, your thyroid medication might need to be changed a little bit when you're pregnant and that kind of stuff. Um, and so usually at your first prenatal visit, um, your doctor should go through all of the medications that you're on and see if any of them need to be dose adjusted, but there are very few that do. There's one question in the chat box. Um, this may have been said, but what about CBD for women with pain during pregnancy? Any effects on the baby, whether internal or topical? I don't think that we know a lot about the CBD effects on fetuses. It doesn't seem like there is a lot of effect in the way that you use um, any marijuana product um, affects how much goes into the bloodstream. So using it topically, much less is going to go into the bloodstream than if you smoke it. Um, and then eating marijuana is kind of in the middle of like smoking and topically. So topically is going to least systemically cause absorption into the bloodstream. So least likely to go to the fetus and smoking is the most likely and most rapid um, way for that to get to the fetus. So ingesting is more um, dangerous than topical use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can babies have adverse effects from the epidural since there are opioids in that? That's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and so the, I should have clarified the opioid use that I'm talking about is, um, pregnant people that use opioids for a long period of time. Um, so the, the thing that makes the epidural a little bit different is that it is, is located in a small area and it works in a small area um, rather than going into your bloodstream and going everywhere. And so we don't actually see a lot that actually goes into the baby. Um, and then the other thing is that even if there is a little bit that goes into the baby, it isn't for a lot, it, the epidural doesn't last long enough for us to see the withdrawal symptoms that you would typically expect in um, parents that use opioids for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And even I had somebody the other day who delivered who had had a broken bone and so they needed to take a little bit of oxycodone during their pregnancy and that mm -hmm. didn't have any effect on the baby um, at the time of delivery because it was just a few different oxycodone pills as opposed to like somebody who's taking 
oxycodone every day from the beginning of their pregnancy all the way through to the end. Mm -hmm. So the concern is more with prolonged use as opposed to like just this one time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I have uh, one other question I was sent privately. Uh, I just read Tylenol, Tylenol is preg in, pre in pregnancy is linked to autism. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I haven't actually heard that one. Have you? No, I think that we don't have a very good understanding about what causes autism. Um, and it's something that's really scary for people. And so a lot of people really worry about it. Um, and I know a while back there was some concern that maybe vaccines caused autism, but what we've seen from lots and lots of studies is that vaccines are very safe and don't lead to an increased rate of autism. Um, and that for some reason here in the States, we have much more autism spectrum disorder than in other places. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't heard that Tylenol is in any way, way linked um, to autism. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think you touched on this um, previously, but just not the uh, uh, fetus, but just a placenta, placenta absorption of drugs and how that that's different from the babies. Can you speak to that a little? If that might, if my question makes sense. Can you ask your question again? Sorry, I had trouble understanding. Yeah, so the placenta absorption or like uh, transmitting uh, those drugs to the baby for um, it's dr the drugs impact on the placenta uh, and the baby I guess or how that's different mm -hmm. that is a good question um I so the effect on the placenta um Things that affect the placenta are concerning because that means that like mm -hmm. nutrition and blood supply to the baby are are hard. Like um, us, there are a few med a few drugs and um, things that can cause the placenta to not work as efficiently, and that can eventually lead to like babies being smaller and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, like yeah, th there are certain drug drug classes that definitely affect mm -hmm. the placenta more than the baby. Um, mm -hmm. Like for example, cocaine can yes. and, and things that are uppers and like increase your blood pressure can lead to mm -hmm. um, your placenta not necessarily forming to the uterine wall as well. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and, and like there being a blood clot in between it. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it just kind of depends on like the, the drug, which one affects the baby, like the fetus more mm -hmm. and which one affects the placenta more. Absolutely, okay, thank you. Um, there's an article in there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Is that for the autism doctor? So we, okay, yeah. Any um, more questions? Dr. Zoe, did you want me to read that aloud or you, well, you just dropped into the chat box? Mm -hmm. oh, you're muted, so. Sorry. <laughs> um, somebody had put in an article from the NIH talking about a meta-analysis study that was done in 2019 um, that looked at mm -hmm. Tylenol use and its mm -hmm. potential link to autism mm -hmm. um, and ADHD. And so what this meta-analysis showed was that there could be some association of with like a, showing an increase in ADHD or ADD mm -hmm. and autism in folks mm -hmm. who are using a lot of Tylenol during their pregnancy. But that was like consistent daily Tylenol that was used um, throughout the course of the pregnancy, kind of like what Fresha was saying before about um, the difference between using oxycodone throughout the entire pregnancy versus like an epidural. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is, I think the Cleveland Clinic article that I put in the chat too, also talks a little bit about the thing that I was mentioning, which is that we 
have seen like a 20% increase overall in autism and ADHD diagnoses in the US. Um, and we don't have a clear reason for that. Um, and sometimes people talk about that maybe we diagnose more because we are testing more. And I think that that is possible. We've certainly seen a pretty big increase in folks being concerned about ADD and ADHD and wanting to be tested. Um, and also there are all of these other factors that are, um, that we haven't really been able to explore that are environmental. Like, is this related to microplastics? Is this related to climate differences? Is this related to diet differences? Is this related to educational differences um, or other societal factors? So the thing about using nausea, uh, like marijuana for nausea, is that is that a no-no like for pregnancy? Um, I think marijuana can be great for nausea in, mm -hmm. for example, in cancer treatment or in other mm -hmm. conditions. Um, I would say during pregnancy, it's kind of risky because we know that it is impacting um, the fetal brain development and yeah. um, probably better to use other options and your doctor can help you um, with other prescribed options that are safe for the fetus and can help with nausea during. Okay. And then Taylor, I see that there's a yeah, yep. question in the chat that says, are you required to report to any CPS or anywhere when a mom has marijuana in their system during birth or during prenatal visits? <laughs> and I don't think that that's reportable. The CPS question is like a little um, tricky and it involves many different people on the healthcare team and not just the doctor team. Um, but I think the main takeaway is that the goal of CPS is try is to try to keep kids with families and it doesn't always feel that way. Um, and there's a lot of fear around that, which I think is really understandable. Um, but there are many times when somebody on the healthcare team has concerns that maybe the baby isn't going to be safe going home with the parents. Um, and CPS will evaluate holistically to see what's going on. Um, and often they'll say like, actually, this isn't something that we're concerned about, but it's kind of multifactorial of like, if there's drug use going on, but also if there's not enough food at home or if there isn't heat at home or if there are unsafe people who are living in the house. Um, so I think a lot of different things go into it. So it, marijuana use could go into somebody requesting that CPS evaluate the parent and a child, but it isn't um, an automatic thing. Mm -hmm. I see the question about um, caffeine ingestion during pregnancy. Um, that's another thing that's kind of intermittently it changes to um, like be people are like, okay, it's okay to drink coffee. It's not okay to drink coffee. Right now, the recommended amount is 200 milligrams of caffeine in pregnancy. And that's typically like a, a cup of coffee during pregnancy. And the reason we try to avoid too much ingestion is it can um, sometimes lead to hypertensive disorders mm -hmm. in pregnancy um, or some studies have shown, but there, I don't know, as far as I know, the evidence isn't super great in that area. Mm -hmm. These are so many good questions today, wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So I was saying marijuana is legal now, so I don't think it's reportable. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Yep. Okay. I think and it kind of goes back to like the amount thing that like if somebody comes in and is like, I sometimes am using some marijuana or I'm using CBD cream or I had a glass of wine the other night or mm. I smoked five cigarettes, that's not something that we would be like, okay, like we need to involve CPS in this case. But if somebody 
came in, for example, or a family member came in and said, this person is smoking marijuana all the time and is so high that they're like not taking care of themselves or not able to take care of the pregnancy or not able to take care of their other kids, then that would be a reason to get CPS involved, even though marijuana is legal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And doctors, as a physician, like, how do you bring out the conversation about someone, like, if they use marijuana, or how, how do you go about asking that if they're on any illicit drugs or anything, if they don't come out and say it? I think the best way to ask is to just straight up ask. Um, mm -hmm. And usually it happens better if like you ask in the middle of the visit rather than towards the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. And so establishing that relationship and that rapport um, and then just straight up asking it. Usually I just like list out certain substances. I'm like, do you use any substances like marijuana, cocaine um, and I, or opioids or the, like these sorts of medications are you any on any medication that's not prescribed by a doctor like those types of questions i think it comes out i think it works better when you just ask straight up because some people don't even know for example that um like smoking marijuana is concerning um or that's mm -hmm. something that a doctor would want to know Um, I think we brought this up in the very beginning of the presentation, so I apologize that we didn't talk about it too much, but there's a question in the chat that says, what's the effect of secondhand smoke, um, smoking of marijuana on babies? And what we see is that you can have detectable levels of THC in your blood, even if you're hanging out with somebody who's smoking marijuana and you're not smoking marijuana. And so um, if it's detectable in your blood, then that can also be impacting um, the fetal brain development. So I think we would worry about that a little bit and recommend um, trying to stay away from folks that are smoking marijuana to avoid that secondhand smoke effect. And then I see a question about how come is fentanyl, uh, fentanyl is okay during labor and delivery as pain management. Um, and the, the reason goes back to kind of what I said about the epidural before, about the duration. Um, and so labor and delivery typically um, last like two days, three days max. Um, and so if, even if you're like coming in for an induction, it's a longer period of time. And if, if you're using fentanyl for pain control a few times during that uh, time that you're here in the hospital, that doesn't lead to addiction. It's when you use it consistently for days and days. Um, and um, that's, that's when we typically see a use disorder, like an addiction um, presentation come about. Also, I think that there's a lot of kind of news about fentanyl on the street and fentanyl being mixed in with other things. And that can be really dangerous because it because it's illegal here, it's not regulated. And so if somebody's using fentanyl on the street, you have no idea what the concentrations of that are. And people can overdose really easily because fentanyl is a really strong opioid that attaches to the receptors in your brain really well, um, which is partly why we use it during labor and delivery, because it works really well at pro providing pain control. Um, but also the fentanyl we use in the hospital is highly monitored and we know exactly how much is in it. And um, the patient is being monitored all, monitored all the time to make sure that they're not having respiratory um, suppression, respiratory rate suppression so that they're breathing totally normally and it's titrated to um, do pain control without causing any negative side effects. And then there's a follow-up question um, about do moms become addicted after receiving fentanyl during birth? And um, just to like clarify, no, like using it a couple of times does not lead to addiction. It's the duration of use. So several days of consistent use. For the uh, THC, um, I find that very interesting. I didn't even know that uh, just by being close to someone that you could be that, that affected. Oh, is it the same with fentanyl? I remember watching a news clip and some officers were called to um, to a peop some people's homes and the officer was standing outside the house and they were doing a lot of fentanyl and he just literally like um, sniffing it. He just started like, you know, he collapsed on the ground and he was just shaking and they had to do, I think, Narcan uh, and use it on him. So is that like almost the same as, I know it's not the same with marijuana, but also does fentanyl have the same effect? by just smelling it? 
Um, just like just like marijuana, there are diff- a lot of different ways to use fentanyl. Some people mm-hmm. crush it, some people smoke it, some people inject it, and so it kind of mm-hmm. depends on the use. Um, mm-hmm. I presume the way the, the video clip that you saw, they maybe had inhaled a little bit of the fentanyl tablet, yeah. um, mm-hmm. and so that that is direct use, basically. Um, and so mm-hmm. I think that's probably the reason they um, required Narcan and stuff. But it just kind of depends on the use, how how it gets absorbed. Okay, and one like the the fact that he was smelling it does that mean like they were burning it or something like it was it's just so much of it was in the air. I don't understand how mm-hmm. that yeah that that was really strange and scary. Mm-hmm. There were also a lot of kind of like fake news stories about this where yeah. mm-hmm. people like opened a packet and saw mm-hmm. fentanyl and then like passed out or like something bad happened to them, and that is totally not true just like looking at a Tylenol or touching a Tylenol isn't going to get Tylenol into your system looking at fentanyl or opening a packet that has fentanyl in it or being like it's nearby to somebody that has fentanyl is not going to cause any problem Mm -hmm. yeah that was just strange maybe there were some confounding issues there but yeah he just started shaking and he got on the ground and his his partner gave him some Narcan and he, he was revived so that was really strange yeah okay um Answered. Any other questions, comments? Mm-hmm. I don't think there are any more questions. Awesome. There were so many interesting questions today. I just couldn't. Yeah, it was awesome. There's there's such great questions. A lot of this is so confused. Oh, was that you, Dr. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Any final words, uh, doctors? I don't think anyone has any questions. Any other questions? Thanks for listening and thanks for all of the great questions. I think it was really helpful to get an idea of what the, the, everybody's concerns were and what they wanted to know. So that was great. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for your uh, awesome presentation. And please do share the uh, slides with me uh, and so I can share it with our audience who would like that. How would you like me to share it with you? Um, you can have Dr. Ibrahim send it to me. She has my email. Yeah. I can, yeah. That's awesome. That's good. We can do and we'll follow Thank you so much for having us. Topic. Absolutely. Thank we'll you. follow up about our next topic. And um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Yep. Everyone have a good rest of your night.